Good evening, and thank you all for joining us. I think we're going to have a wonderful conversation. It's my great pleasure to be here with Dr. Kenyoro and Mrs. Robinson. And from now on, I'm going to call them Musimbi and Mary because we're all friends up here, and I know that they embrace informality. So I hope that you don't mind that. I'm sure you won't. Um, we're discussing climate justice and women's role in ensuring uh, a better future for us all. And we're also going to talk about Mary's new book, Climate Justice, Hope, Resilience, and a Fight for a Sustainable Future. Um, this book just came out this past week, and I must say, uh, Musimbi and I both received advanced copies, and we have read it, and it's really an incredible book. It brought tears to my eyes in some parts, and um, it's quite a journey, so I would really encourage people to read it. Um, but I want to go back and start with you two women. Um, Mary, you and I worked together for six years in New York at your organization, Realizing Rights, the Ethical Globalization Initiative. And I remember in my second year there in 2006, you said to me, oh, a wonderful woman is coming in today, Musimbi Kenyoro. And you <laughs> thought I would know her, but I had just come from 15 years in working in East Asia in the Middle East, and I hadn't come across Musimbi. So I want to start by asking you <coughs> where you two first met. How did you get to know each other? We met when we were both working in Geneva. I was working as High Commissioner for Human Rights, and Musimbi was the Secretary General of the YWCA, the Young Women's Worldwide. Worldwide, Worldwide. yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> we know uh, it. Is. I do remember on one occasion she brought me to this very long religious ceremony <laughs> in Geneva. <laughs> I mean, it took an hour and a half. It was it was excessively <laughs> long, um, but uh, <laughs> we, uh, we we also went together to a number of. Uh, uh, opportunities for women to show a bit of leadership in Africa. Um, I remember in particular, uh, we went to Eastern Chad to try to meet with women who'd uh, had terrible suffering um, in, um, the, um, uh, in uh, you know, uh, and had come across to um, Eastern Chad um, from from the conflict from there. The, yeah. yeah. And, um, and, you know, that was very telling. And um, the person who was uh, in, in involved in, uh, that's why I'm so emotional about it, in talking about it, is, um, it was Joe Cox, who then became an MP. Uh, she'd been working for Oxfam. It was Oxfam who was supporting us and was killed, as we know, very sadly. Um, just before the Brexit referendum in the UK. And Joe was such a wonderful guide and mentor on that occasion. And uh, it's just a sad memory. Yes. Um, but it was one of the uh, visits together that we did to African countries. And um, the Simbi I, I learned a lot from. I learned in particular how, as the Secretary General of the YWCA, she was determined that young women had to be involved not just as a sort of add-on, but very significantly in any public forum. And I really admired the way she worked at that. And Ms. Imbi, maybe you'd like to talk about it a bit, but you were determined that um, young women shouldn't be left to the last on a platform, that they needed to be involved very centrally and proportionately and appropriately and have their voices heard. And I, uh, th it was a lesson that was important to me in my climate justice work, th how, how we hear the voices of people that need to be heard. Thank you. Mm. Musimbi, do you want to add to that or do you want to share any other memories of traveling with Mary? I want to share uh, another memory of traveling with Mary, which is really important. Thank you very much. Um, when we went to uh, Eastern Chad, specifically to pay attention to what was happening in Dafu, I saw a Maori that uh, I needed to know because I saw someone with integrity. Well, first of all, it was the way that he was able to negotiate with the leadership, very top leadership, the President of France, the Prime Minister of Britain, the uh, Chancellor in Germany, and um, um, for the fact that we would go there and we would come back and we would bring the reports of what we had had from the people in that 
area, and specifically the women, and that their responsibility was when they go to the United Nations meeting that was just about to happen in September, mm. that they would be able to take those voices to the General Assembly. And indeed, we went and listened. And we went back and had audience with each of these world leaders. And Maori, as our leader, told the stories as we saw them with the exact words of women and men who would never have been heard at the United Nations if they hadn't been someone that would carry their evidence. And so we were able to actually help the President of France, the Prime Minister of Britain, and the Chancellor of Germany to carry stories, live stories, in the discussion that was happening on DAFO. And uh, I have held that respect for Mary for that long. We've had fun sometimes, like me taking her to my country, and then I take her to a place where we could pat a leopard. And first she was <laughs> quite afraid. And said, no, don't worry. Don't worry. We can actually tame our leopards. <laughs> so we've, ha we've had some fun, but we continue to have very serious encounters. It was encounters. like a very, very big cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing That's what that. I thought I'd yeah. share. Yeah. 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 So, Mary, you are known as a real icon in the field of human rights. Um, you know, I would say the preeminent leader. Um, but in your book, you talk about a moment in time where you suddenly realized how important climate change w was. And how I think you say it's the a or the most important human rights issue mm -hmm. of our time. Can you talk about mm -hmm. the moment that that really dawned on you? What was it that happened? Well, first of all, uh, you know, I missed it. Uh, when I was serving as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights for five years, from 1997 to 2002, I never really linked the injustice of human rights and, and human rights, uh, the injustice of climate change and human rights. You know, I, I just didn't get it. Um, it. It was partly because there was another part of the UN that was dealing with climate change, mm. and we were in our silos. I was dealing with human rights, gender issues, disability, et cetera, and there was another part dealing with climate change. And it was only when I st set up the organization that you worked with me in Realizing Rights um, <coughs> that we were working on uh, health issues, on women, peace and security, on right to food. And uh, we, were, we were a very small organization, so we had to partner with a lot of partners, including Oxfam and other partners, and we were traveling to different parts of Africa. And everywhere I went, I heard the same sentence, m more or less, things are so much worse now. We don't know how to cope. And when I probed, it was everything that had been predictable was now unpredictable about climate and weather. When to harvest, when to sow. Um, when I went to Liberia, and would meet with Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, and we worked a lot in Liberia for realizing rights. Um, I would have breakfast with Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, and she said to me, Mary, when I was growing up in Liberia, we had two rainy seasons, and they were so predictable. They came within days, and we knew exactly when we would sow and exactly when we would harvest. Now it's completely changed. I don't know when the rainy season will come. I don't know for how long. I can't even mend my roads. So that was her perspective. And then the other perspective was the one I learned from uh, Constance O'Kellett. Is Constance with us? Yes. Ah, Constance, <laughs> my friend. Hi, Constance. Constance is in the book. <laughs> um, I learned from Constance O'Kellett from Eastern Uganda, uh, whose story is in the book, and she's much better than the story, but we did our best to tell her story as well as we could with her. and. Uh, you know, when she had a terrible storm in 2007, floods came to her village, destroyed her village, destroyed all the houses. She moved away from the village for a short time, then came back. And on the first night, there were 27 people in her house because the, ro the, the, ro the walls were there. The roof, I think, had been destroyed, but at least there was something there. And she talked about how she recovered from that. And we must have you talking this evening, Constance, because you're a great voice for yourself um, and uh, a great friend. But mm. um, I remember Constance saying, and it stays with me, 
we thought God was punishing us. And then we learned it was the lives of rich people. Mm -hmm. And then Constance went to her first climate conference in um, her, the capital of Uganda, uh, in Kampala, and then became um, a climate wise woman um, coming to conferences on climate. And her voice is a very important voice in that. But um, uh, all of that I had missed. And when I learned seriously of the injustice of climate change, the fact that it disproportionately affects communities, um, that um, people who don't drive cars, don't have central heating, don't have big manufacturing, are so buffeted and don't even know why. Think God is punishing them. Think this is something, um, uh, have we done something wrong that everything has changed? And uh, it became for me um, an extraordinary human rights issue, gender issue, issue of climate justice. And I'm now uh, so aware that this injustice is not really being addressed in our world. It's not really being understood. And we need to do it in a development sense. We need to ensure, for example, that the benefits of clean energy get to poor communities. Mm. And yet um, they don't actually. Um, the amount of climate financing that gets to distributive off-grid finance is minimal. Mm -hmm. um, there are big mega projects, but there's very little for the rural communities um, to have uh, homes with solar panels, to have clinics um, for medical reasons, you know, so um, women can have safe childbirth, schools um, that would benefit so greatly. None of this is happening at the pace it could happen. And there are still hundreds of millions of people who never switch the switch for electricity, never get the benefit. And uh, so I have a passion now um, to see that that could change and that we could actually recognize that that's the, that's the quickest um, uh, uh, gain that we could have uh, to get um, the benefit of clean energy to the communities that have the injustice of suffering from climate change. Mm -hmm. And you profile so many extraordinary leaders in your book. I wonder what 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 do they have in common? You meet extraordinary people all year long. How did you choose the, the, the cases in the book, those particular ones? What do they share? Well, I think the idea, actually, Constance is the first story in the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, the story started with a hearing um, with Archbishop Tutu and myself on behalf of Oxfam before the Copenhagen Climate Summit. Most of you will know of the Copenhagen Summit that didn't really succeed. There were great expectations and there was great disappointment. But um, uh, Oxfam decided to try to find these voices that needed to be heard before Copenhagen. And so they find us, found us five farmers from Africa and four of them were women, which is the truth that women do most of the farming in Africa. And um, they came um, to a hearing before uh, Archbishop Tutu. And um, uh, Constance was the one who made a big impact on me because she said, um, when I challenged um, the five farmers, that you know, farmers always complain about the weather. They do it in Ireland. <laughs> you know, the, you know, and, and she said with great dignity, she said, this is outside our experience. And I'll never forget her saying that. It was, it was just one of those moments. And then I had to know more about her story. Um, we tried in the stories to tell from different perspectives. One of the stories is about a former head of state. I was the head of state of Ireland. When I was he president of Ireland, I never, in all my travels and my meeting with Irish people and other people, never had to come back to my country and tell my people they had no future. They had no future. That is what Anato Tong, the president of Kiribati, had to tell his people after Copenhagen, mm. because he could see they didn't care about the fact that we had to stay at 1.5 degrees of warming above pre-industrial standards, not two degrees and not above two degrees, but 1.5 degrees, or his tiny atolls spread over a wide area would go under because they're very low, low level above sea level. 
And he came back and he told his people and he tried to, you know, put a brave face on the situation. And then he decided to fight back. He bought land in Fiji for his people so that they would have somewhere to go to. And um, then he is now trying to see if he can get support to raise the islands so that they will withstand more than one point, you know, the, the um, sea level rise at 1.5 degrees so that he will have a sovereign country. If not, they will move to this land in Fiji, but they won't be a sovereign country. Yeah. They'll be a neighborhood of others in mm -hmm. Fiji. And I, I find that a really difficult story. Uh, a number of the stories are in indigenous peoples, not just in Africa. We have a lovely story of Hindu, of Eastern Chad, who's just a wonderful leader now mm -hmm. um, of the indigenous peoples in discussions on climate. But in the United States, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the problem of Katrina in 2005, which hit not just uh, New Orleans, but East um, Biloxi, um, in Mississippi, and um, the hero of this, um, Sharon um, Hens Henshaw, um, was a, had a hairdressing salon, and people would come to her salon, um, you know, uh, and gossip. And she understood the importance of listening and being supportive to those who came and um, got their hair done and their nails done, etc. And um, she was part of the fight back after her whole community was destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, very brave, because her father had been a kind of leader of the, um, you know, what, what we would call now Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, a, a fight back in, um, in, in Mississippi. And she came to uh, Copenhagen and sat with Constance. And Constance called her Minis um, Mississippi woman. Isn't that right, Constance? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and I think, uh, I remember Sharon saying to me, she found it strange to be sitting with developing country women, but she was in the same situation yes. post-Katrina. Yeah, very similar. She had nothing. She was absolutely devastated. And she was mm. um, trying to become more resilient. And uh, so it's, it's a story from different perspectives mm. that we're trying to trying to tell. Yeah. And, and they're really important at understanding what's happening in our world. Musimi, do you have a personal story around climate change you want to share? I could tell you 20, but... <laughs> Can you choose one? <laughs> yes, yes. Mm. Well. But um, I, I, want to, I, I want to pitch them to Mary's book, uh, because there's a, there's, a, there's a way in which, when you realize that what happens up in the climate, what happens in the environment, really joins us and goes to prove that we live in one world. Um, I could tell you a story of the fact that I grew up in a rural farming area. Uh, we planted lots of pineapples, lots of uh, maize, what you might call corn. This we was Kenya? Yeah, yes, the good country. So, <laughs> 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 yes, um, really always had plenty, I, I never, had or, or knew that people stayed hungry. Because if you live on a farm and you plant what you need, you eat from that. Hmm. Today I go back home and I find the place where the rivers used to flow in the area, the rivers are dry. Hmm. So people have to find different ways of getting water. And the way they do it now is to dig under. Uh, so that the wells can bring water from under. But what happened to those rivers makes me really sad. Yeah. As children, we had, for example, um, each child would be assigned uh, a little garden on which to plant your own mm. uh, whatever that you wanted to plant, whether it was uh, uh, spinach or onions or tomatoes. But the intention was to see them grow and be really like vi vibrant and nice. and. Uh, it's not possible to do that easily without having some irrigation. Mm. So the the whole issue of uh, the change um, in the environment in which we live is so real. Um, in my country, again, you ask me to give a, a personal story. I was very surprised that this year, a Canadian person whom I have known as living in Kenya and goes uh, to Canada in winter time said that it was really cold and she had to wear 
warm clothes. When you hear a Canadian person who comes from a <laughs> snow land <laughs> saying that it was cold this July, something is the matter. Yeah. Because that was, wasn't mm. always the case. That mm. wasn't the, always the case. So there is something that is really, people can notice it. They don't always say what it is. We at the Global Fund for Women, we realize that when you are working with communities, it's not so much that they have to name it in the terms that we know, like climate is changing or things are drying, but they experience it, they can tell. They can tell whether uh, cold seasons are longer. They can tell when they don't get the rains on time. They can tell mm. when you have shorter um, uh, dry seasons, for example, etc. And they know something is wrong. So what we do at the Global Fund is to realize that their experience requires listening to, believing them, and finding ways to support them. And how do you support them? It might be that they need to have seeds that are much more resilient, that can be able to align, to adapt to the different changes. It might be that what they need at a particular time is to protest what is happening that is wrong. For example, um, if there are low people who come from various places and they want to cut the trees. Many of the programs that we support, whether they are in uh, Central America, in parts of Asia, in parts of Africa, are women who are resisting the cutting of the forests, the vegetations, cutting them to, explo to export wood, cutting them to sell firewood, um, to other places that are far away, cutting them to build cities, cutting them to make these spaces become what is so-called developed, when it's actually mm. underdeveloping. And sometimes they risk their lives and their livelihoods by defending the water and land rights exactly. and forest rights. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. They get killed on mm. the front line. Mm. We're very present with those kind of women and men and communities because we believe that their voices need to be heard, their leaders. Those are the leaders that Mary has put in her book. And those are the leaders which, when I read the book, I hear her speaking for the communities um, that we at the Global Fund and other groups of people really feel aligned and in support of for their work, to really make sure that their voices are heard and they are heard not just where they are, they are hard in places where decisions are made. So I was very pleased to know that the women that are in this book went to Copenhagen, they went to the meetings in Nairobi, they went to the meetings in New York, because this is important to hear those voices speak for themselves. And that's the kind of work that really resonates with yes. who we are as justice people. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to conclude on that by saying when Mary uses climate justice and when we use justice, we have to remember that justice implies that there is injustice. Justice requires that something, there is imbalance somewhere. And so the whole work of justice is to create an opportunity to get the balance that you mm -hmm. need. And this balance is important for the environment as it is for people. Mm. Yes, okay. thanks. Mm. I, I, I want to come back to that, but I want to shift for a moment um, to the question of women political leaders who are also mentioned in your book. Um, you mentioned early in the book, Mary, something called the Troika, the women's Troika, and then the Troika Plus. And then um, this is about women who are negotiating in the UN trip at the UNFCCC, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And then toward the end of the book, you talk about Christiana Figueres. And all of these women are also heroes to us. And you mentioned she has a plaque on her wall that reads, impossible is not a fact, it's an attitude. <laughs> um, so you and other women, Musimbi and others, worked both publicly and behind the scenes on, um, on really influencing from what were some early losses in the UNFCCC negotiations to coming out with a, the with a Paris Agreement. And Christiane, mm -hmm. of course, was one of the architects of that. Um, I think we'd like to know, um, was there any, what's, wh what creates that sisterhood of leaders who are pushing on the negotiations? Um, is there, how do you keep that momentum going? Is there a special handshake? How does that work? <laughs> 
not a handshake, but actually a realization that it's different for men and women, that actually climate change in many, many of its impacts is worse for women um, because of social uh, different roles locally, um, because uh, women have to go further for water and for firewood if there's drought. Uh, women have to put food on the table. Women, even in hurricanes, can't run so fast in a long dress, um, can't climb trees, um, uh, keep, uh, you know, are focused on their children and die in much greater proportions. And so um, a number of us recognized, uh, especially after the kind of breakdown of um, a good um, sort of progress um, at Copenhagen. I mean, Copenhagen, yes, we got the Copenhagen Accords, but the, the UN system was suffering from uh, smaller, vulnerable countries being shut out of the room, etc. And so the next conference was in Mexico, in Cancun. And there just happened to be a number of women there who were playing leadership roles, notably three women um, had either chaired or about to chair the three conferences in a row. Mm. Um, Connie Hedegaard had chaired Copenhagen before she became the Climate um, Action uh, Commissioner of the European Union. Um, Patricia Espinosa was chairing as foreign minister in Cancun, and Mighty Mashaban was about to chair in Durban the following year. And those three women were on a platform, and I remember it was the current woman who's about to be uh, the president of the General Assembly, uh, Minister Espinosa of Honduras, who said, why don't we form a troika of women leaders mm -hmm. on gender and climate change? And Patricia Espinosa said, as the minister, as the host of the conference, yes, why don't we form? And um, uh, as Realising Rights, we said, well, we can provide secretarial support and you had a lot to do with how we how we did that as managing director of uh, realizing rights. But uh, what we realized was that um, if women as ministers who were at the table, who were in the conference, who had the capacity to take decisions, who could actually ask their delegates to do things, if we could uh, take this on as an issue, maybe we could make a difference. Mm -hmm. And we actually made an interesting difference um, at the next COP um, after Durban. Um, when we met in Durban, there were 40 um, either ministers um, of environment or energy or climate change or um, heads of agencies like um, Helen Clark, head of UNDP at the time, Fumzili, head of UN Women. And we also had a number of men ministers um, we kept men strictly in their place, of course, <laughs> but we did acknowledge that they should be included, and they were. And um, in Durban, we planned to have a stronger decision about women being involved in delegations in committees and um, uh, structures of the Conference on Climate. And uh, so we came with our revised and strengthened decision, draft decision rather, um, to uh, Doha. And Christiana Figueres, whom you mentioned, um, had been very involved in this, and um, UN women were very involved. We had all the brain power um, devising this. We got the European Union, uh, the European um, uh, Union members to adopt this on our behalf, on behalf of the Troika of Women Leaders on Gender and Climate Change. And uh, when I arrived in Doha, I got a strong message, an urgent message from Christiana Figueres to come to her office. There was a problem. So I came to Christiana's office and she said, unfortunately, a lawyer in the European Commission office, because the European Union were going to propose this, a lawyer had looked at the small print of how you put forward decisions at a COP and discovered that if you put forward a decision, a draft decision, um, it, it shouldn't basically be decided at the same COP, which was what we were determined had to happen for various reasons. And Christiana said to me, Mary, I'm afraid it's, it's almost impossible. And luckily I said to her, Christiana, define almost. And she said, well, if the president of the conference decides that we could do this and sees there is support in the floor for that, 
maybe maybe it would be possible. So uh, the chair of the COP in Doha was the minister from Qatar, who was a man with a moustache, not a woman. And <laughs> so we had to work on him. We had to work on all of the delegations. And I still remember the incredible emotion when this motion was moved by the European Union on behalf of the um, uh, Troika Plus of Women um, uh, Leaders on, on Gender and Climate. Um, I think Grenada was the first voice in. Mm -hmm. um, Japan came in, the United States came in, Iceland came in, the, uh, uh, Mexico came in, the various from all parts. And then South Africa held back. Um, uh, Ambassador Siko of um, uh, South Africa, who had been very involved in uh, the Durban conference as the climate um, envoy of, the, of, of South Africa, and she knew exactly how to play this. And she waited until everybody else had spoken, and there was a, clearly a lot of support on the floor for this decision. And she said to the president of the COP, she said, Mr. President, you know that three women have presided over three conferences on climate, but you can do something even more for women than those three <laughs> women, because <laughs> you could take a decision now that this draft decision would be put for consultation and would go to the SBI as it was, to go to another body and uh, you know, be part of the, and that we might have a decision at the end of the day. And it was, it was like theater. He threw up his arms and he said, what can I do, a mere man? <laughs> 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 and then he looked down and he saw what, uh, what Christiana Figueres had written out for him. I see that there is broad support for this. I now refer it for yes. thing. And oh. it, um, it took six hours of discussion and thing, but there were women there, who, and we got this yeah. reinforced decision, which Christiana has always called the Doha miracle. Mm -hmm. So that was the first victory of the uh, Troika uh, uh, plus of women uh, leaders on, on gender and climate change. And then with the broad constituency of women, we worked for the Gender Action Plan, and now gender is very much part of the... And, 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 and um, the... Uh, Troika then took upon itself a very important message, which was, OK, so we've got the gender action plan, but who are the voices that we're to hear? And so now th the Troika is very keen that um, women ministers bring the Constances and the Hindus and the other women that are in the book to the table, bring them as delegates. Um, Ireland has brought Constance as a delegate um, to conferences. Constance, I think you need to come up here and, and, and be one of the yes. panel here. I mean, you, you shouldn't yes. be sitting in, yes. you're, you're yes. you know. <laughs> I want to say something. Why don't you come up here and, um, and, and Heather will ask you yes. a question. Yes, as Constance <laughs> comes, I want, to s I want to name what Mary's been saying. What Mary's been saying in the <laughs> women's movement, we don't call it, <laughs> we don't call it, <laughs> I've had Constance to dinner, by the way, so we're old friends. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Constance. So as we welcome Constance, I wanted to say what Mary has been saying <laughs> Come on, uh, in the women's movement, we don't call it miracle. We call it networking and movement building. <laughs> and the reason we call it networking is that we know that when you network, you share ideas, you share strategies, you share concerns, you share experiences, you become stronger together. And you form internally, whether you name it or not, you become a movement. The number of times that Mary and others convened us to talk about Troika when Heather was a staff that time, was actually that movement building. So by the time this group of people are in front of those um, uh, leaders or in front of a situation, their strategies become natural in themselves. They know that mm. you need to pass the ball. Mm. You need to listen to each other. And they know that they are speaking from experiences that are so true that you cannot doubt them. So these miracles that we experience are miracles of networking and movement building mm. to which we ask 
more support because this is what sustains the visions and dreams of the people all over the world. When they become a movement, you cannot break mm. them because mm. they go together and nothing can be able to break the movements. And mm. the global movement on climate change is really what is bringing us mm. here together and mm. making us tell the same mm. story, all of us together. Thank yeah. you. So, Constance, I'd like to ask you, since Mary invited you up again, Constance Akalet works with an organization in Uganda and is a farmer. We once had an event uh, organized by Climate Wise Women where Constance was on a panel with a farmer from Indiana, also named Constance, which was a wonderful, <laughs> a really wonderful event. Um, I was going to ask Mary and Musimbi this question, but I'll ask you as well. Here we are, many people coming to San Francisco this week for the Global Climate Action Summit. When I looked at the program a few months ago, I didn't see very much on the program about gender mm. or about climate justice. Uh, it seemed rather technical, a day on science, a day on policy. And what I've seen over the last few months is a real change, both in terms of what's happening inside the conference itself, but also in terms of side events and a real mobilization, literally hundreds and hundreds of people coming to, to, say, to use their voices to talk about something different. So Constance, tell us a little bit about what you're doing here this week and what are the messages you hope to get across? Just stop. <laughs> what you do? Tell so us well. what you'll tell them in the conference. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What are you going to tell in the conference? Yeah. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm so grateful to meet everybody, and I'm very happy to be next to Her Excellency. Thank you very much. My name is Akosi Sokolate. Can I do without this? Can no, it work? You, you have it. to do because we're being recorded for the radio. Okay. Always in my country, we stand when we are talking. <laughs> and this is a very important issue to talk about. Uh, my name is Kosen Sokolate. I come from Uganda. I come from the eastern part of Uganda, at the border of Kenya and Uganda. Uh, the issue that has brought me here is to come and talk about my situation down in my community. I am a peasant farmer. You know what a peasant farmer is? I don't use a tractor. I don't use a, the, the big, big uh, well, what, machines to dig. I use a hoe to dig. Me and my family, I produce food for my family and other people because I produce something to eat and to sell. So I've come to tell the people that in my community we are not experiencing the past good days when I was a child growing up. And now it's so far different from that time. I grew up a strong girl, very strong, very healthy, not even a headache. But these days, nothing because we used to eat everything. We used to have everything. We used to have those wild foods in the forests. Just get up one morning, go and pick those f fruits, or the foods, you eat them. Those are some, some, some are medicinal, some are foods. You don't get sick at all, but these days it's no longer there. However much you look for it, it is no longer there you will come and find the ground very bare, no tree, no what. And that's why we are suffering. Women walk long distance, distances to look for water. Women walk long distances to look for firewood. Women suffer. The, it, the suffering has doubled because in the past it was simple. Just get it and put it on table. But today you have to double your effort to get that thing and put it on table. So it's a bit difficult for the women at grassroots to earn the living of their families. And we used to go to school anytime, early morning, 
but this time during the floods you can children don't cross you find so many school dropouts because of the floods because children go cannot cross maybe they go to stay with the neighbors you find the children maybe they are raped maybe they are by those neighbors maybe they are defiled you find early pregnancies a child carrying a child things that used not to happen that's why i say things have changed from Conf the good Conf to the bad so things have changed and you describe what do you think this conference in california should be thinking about to help your community what i've been asking whenever i go to any conference first of all we need there's adaptation and mitigation funds we need that money to the community let the community have that money to change their life from at least to do something alternative not the real digging all the time all the time other business other businesses can come up and there's advocacy. Explain what you've been doing in your community. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, for us, what we do, we, of recent, I say thank you to Global Green Grant. Green Grant gave us 5,000 US dollars. We bought plows. Uh, you know what a plow is? <laughs> <laughs> that is additional. Eh? From the hoe to a plow, mm. more food to be produced, more cells, more life. So there is hope. So we do savings and credit. We do agriculture. We do cook stoves, clean energy. We do tree planting because we see we don't have many forests. Forests are over. We mm. say plant any tree that you have it. Get a mango tree, plant it on the compound. Don't say that my land is small. No, the land is not small. Put a shed. You will harvest that food. It's a food. It's a, the leaves you will pick and burn, make the, char the charcoal. That is the briquette. And then the branches you cut and use for cooking instead of walking that long distance. So you find women are planting trees. Women are now using briquettes. Have solar. What about solar? Out of that, we buy solar for our children to do what? To read in the night. Because children don't do bread. Most children, they are given work at school, they come back because they don't have the light. They only have the moonlight because the moonlight is there for us in my community. You find so many people outside having their supper under the moonlight because they don't have the money to buy the paraffin for the light. So we advocate for people to have the solar. And it's cheap and it's easy to get it because you pay once and you continue using it. So, so Constance, I was going to ask Musimbi <coughs> about her ideas when someone is giving money, whether it's $10 or a million dollars, what it should fund. But I think you've, you've given a great answer, so I'm going to skip that question. <laughs> <laughs> She's answered on your behalf. But let Good. me move on to the audience yeah. questions because I think I want to make sure we get some of those in. And we'll come back to you, Constance. And this is really for any of you. Um, here's a question. As soon as something is called women's, the attendance becomes predominantly female, although I must say we have a lot of men in this audience tonight. How can we focus on the importance of women in finding uh, solutions uh, to global problems without isolating women from the central con conversations? So um, Constance has managed to do that in her community. I think, can we talk a little bit more about how that happens in central governments or at the negotiating table? Do you want to? Yeah, go. Um, it, it, it's possibly not the answer you're expecting, um, Heather, but um, 
I'm so keen to, um, you know, get this idea of climate change into people's lives in a way that's mm -hmm. uh, real to them. That uh, I've engaged now in a podcast. A year ago, I didn't know what a podcast was because I'm <laughs> old, and I'm doing this podcast with an Irish woman who's a comedian living in New York, uh, Maeve Higgins, and she has done quite a few podcasts, so she's used to podcasts. And the point about it is that what we're trying to do is to say climate change is a man-made problem, but that does not exclude women. You know, man-made includes women, and we need a feminist solution, and that mm. does not exclude men. <laughs> and we're trying to kind of have a conversation mm, yeah. about um, how uh, we can have a progressive uh, solution based on equality between men and women, but looking towards, and in it with a particular climate justice approach, obviously. Up to now, the women that we've interviewed have, be, uh, the, the, the Mothers of Invention, that's the name of the podcast, that we've interviewed have been women, <laughs> but in New York, we're going to have a man mother of invention to they and what we're trying to do is precisely get away from the idea that it has to be women who only dr address so-called women's issues mm -hmm. and to broaden it into um, a, a concern about um, the issues that Constance has been talking about, the issues that we all need to be talking about in, 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 in different ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in our episodes, um, we've talked about um, divestment, and I took part in a press conference here about divestment, and it's uh, very good to see uh, how much that is accelerating now, the divestment and investment in clean energy. Mm -hmm. um, but we talked to various people about that. We then talked about climate litigation, and we've talked about plastics, so and we've talked about health. And um, what, what we're trying to do is um, you know, really get a conversation going that will um, be, um, you know, uh, that will bring home that this is something we all have to get engaged in. It's not a women's issue as such in any sense, but it's an mm -hmm. issue for, for everyone. Mm -hmm. So women as catalysts, but not, yes. not, yeah. not the only and ones. And as leaders. Yeah. And as, yeah. yeah. Mosimbi, anything to add to that? That was very well said, but I could say that um, some of the spaces where her women have come uh, by uh, our spaces for women have been really spaces of women uh, getting energy from each other um, and getting the facts right. But they have not been spaces meant to stay that way. Women gather to think about how they could, how, how the world could be inclusive. And they gather to think about how they could be able to bring those agendas that girls and women have experienced that often have not found their place on the main agenda. And they gather to say, how can they get the wisdom, the energy, the strength, the skills, and the, uh, the knowledge to also be at the tables where the decisions are made? But uh, it's always been to do this so that the world can become more inclusive. And uh, for those of us that work, say, in women's organizations, women's movements, and women's funds, every day we want to be out of work. <laughs> and we want to be out of work by seeing our communities and our societies and our family more embracing, more inclusive. Sustainable development goals for me have been part of that hope because in every sustainable development goal, I see opportunities for everybody. Hmm. And uh, I see opportunities for um, for women and men together. And I like also for the fact that in sustainable development goals, we deal with that other thing of the north-south, poor, rich, mm. because all these binaries mm. uh, make us poorer people. And the moment we deal with these binaries, we become better together, better across gender, across race, across anything that you can imagine. And that's, I think, how 
the world was supposed to be. So let's keep working on it. That's a great, great thought. Actually, we had another question from the audience specifically on the Sustainable Development Goals. If you don't know what they are, there are 17 goals that the world, all the world's governments have signed on to to achieve by the year 2030. And the question was specifically, how, um, how has the growth and the development of the Sustainable Development Goals informed your work on climate justice and women's rights? Yeah, it's a very good question because I think the important thing about the... 17, as you say, sustainable development goals, which is quite a lot, mm -hmm. and it's quite complex, but it was a negotiated um, mm -hmm. agenda, the 2030 agenda. It was negotiated by 193 countries, mm -hmm. uh, and that means that um, you know it, it was messy, and it was long, and it was, and, and we were trying to you know influence that there would be a climate goal because in initially. Um, it wasn't obvious yeah. that there would be a climate change goal We've as one of the 17. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad to say it's there because that then links with the Paris Climate Agreement and, and makes it easier to see that as part of the sustainable development and the goals of the uh, Paris Climate Agreement show that we have to be rigorous. We have to cut the emissions to stay on course to be well below two, two degrees of warming above pre-industrial standards and work for 1.5 degrees of warming um, and uh, I, I you know like both of you really find um, that the goals are, are very meaningful because they go beyond the idea of the earlier goals which were the millennium development goals were only for developing countries these goals are for all countries they're for the United States they're for Ireland they're for Europe they're for Japan they're for the whole world and every country has to think about how to integrate these goals and yet um, I was talking to the Deputy Secretary General in Dublin the other day Amina Mohammed. she was in Ireland mm. for a very good event for an Irish aid agency called Concern Worldwide which does great mm. work mm. and um, because it was the 50th anniversary she was there and she was saying somewhat ruefully you know, there are still heads of state in the world who don't know what the 17 Sustainable Development Goals are. Mm. You know, never mind. And they're not, they're not working with their governments in the way that she, w that Amina would like to see, and that we, we should see that um, you know that that this is an agenda that was seriously negotiated in 2015, and is the right agenda for our world to put us on course for a safe world and a, and a, a not only a safe but a you know, a, a sustainable, um, good world for young people mm. where they'll have jobs, where they'll have a future, where they'll have hope. And they'll also have that sense of um, solidarity, um, which is at the heart of the goals, leave no one behind. And even a phrase that I never heard in a, an international agreement, prioritize the furthest behind first, which is an extraordinary commitment. And if we only would do that, um, it would actually change development quite a lot. Um, in, in how we do it. Um, so um, uh, the, the Sustainable Development Goals, I feel, are extraordinarily important for climate justice, but also um, are a great hope for the world. And we mustn't allow you know, the current populism and um, divisiveness that has entered the world to, to, to make us forget that we actually have this agenda, yes. um, that it is the agenda for our world. Speaking of divisiveness, we have another... Um, <laughs> Another question from the audience. Um, this was directed to you, Mary, but I think I'll ask all three of you to answer. Um, you were a tremendous president uh, for the citizens of Ireland. What advice do you have for the current US president? <laughs> <laughs> we can stay on climate change and climate justice and women. Uh, no, I, I have to say <laughs> that when President Trump um, said that he was pulling the United States out of the Paris Agreement, it was a worrying moment. Um, and uh, the reality is the good news of the resilience and the determination of such a broad spectrum of the American people, despite their president saying that, saying, we are still in. And that's what this summit here in California is all about. Um, that states in the United States, cities in the United States, 
philanthropy in the United States, business in the United States, universities in the United States, trade unions in the United States, broad citizens' movements in the United States are determined that um, it is important to adhere to the Paris Climate Agreement and indeed the Sustainable Development Goals. And it's good to see that commitments are actually being made. Um, the mayor of New York and the mayor of London mm. made commitments today. Mm. Um, uh, the um, Governor Brown, on behalf of this state, has signed um, a bill about um, moving more rapidly to clean electricity, to do it by uh, 2045. That's leadership within the states of the United States, and that's all really good to hear. Um, I regret that um, there is a president of the United States who isn't giving that leadership because it matters. Um, I mean, all of us know that that has slowed things internationally. Um, there's less driving commitment to the Paris Agreement. Um, it was President Obama and the Chinese president at the time who together forged a strong momentum forward. And then small states um, had the high ambition, the Marshall Islands, a small island state, led the high ambition coalition in the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. And between them, um, top down and bottom up, if you like, um, they forged a, a, a very fair, um, uh, far reaching agreement because it's saying um, uh, we, the, we have to commit to being well below two degrees of Celsius of warming and work for 1.5 degrees, and we have to be carbon neutral by the second half of the century. We actually have to be carbon neutral by 2050. And that's the that's yeah. the uh, the commitment. Um, somehow, countries have slipped on this. Um, the Secretary General Antonio Guterres, whom I know very well, I knew him when he was Prime Minister of Portugal. We worked together when I was High Commissioner for Human Rights in the UN system. I think he's a really good Secretary General of the UN. He said today in a very strong speech, calling for his climate summit in 2019, we are careering towards the abyss, careering towards the abyss. Mm -hmm. And everybody has mm -hmm. to get re real on this. And you know, when a, um, you know, when a Secretary General uses that kind of language, we know that um, we, we, we should not be comfortable about where mm -hmm. we are. A lot of good things are happening. It is very much possible, and indeed it's um, very feasible that we can and have enough time to make the changes that are needed. But we need political leadership. And it's a pity when the president of a great country like this is not leading in the way that states and cities of the United States are trying to lead. It's, it's, um, uh, it's less effective, but um, we have to keep on and hope that uh, the political dynamics in this country will change and that the United States will get back to a leadership at, mm. at all levels on this issue. It is interesting. When we worked together 10 years ago, we put out a report that talked about what we called rogue weather events. I remember that. And 10 years ago, they weren't as common as they are today. But now they seem so common. And mm. yet still, the feeling of urgency doesn't seem to be there as much as one might expect from, from the I, context. I think, I think ordinary people do mm. see it now. I, 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 I mean, certainly. Uh, you know, um, uh, Ireland um, has done one very good thing. Ireland is the first country in the world to pass a bill in the parliament um, to divest from fossil fuel as a country. Mm. So I'm proud of that. But Ireland is not good enough on climate change. And our um, Taoiseach, our prime minister, said in the European parliament that we're something of a laggard on climate change, which was not a comfortable thing to have to admit, and we have to do a lot more. But um, I find that um, you know ordinary people in Ireland are completely changed in their perception of climate. I I assume it's the same here in California with with the fires, with and then with the knowledge that there are fires going up to the Arctic, and um, that the droughts and the flooding are so much worse in every country and every part of the world now, and there's about to be a uh, a hurricane hitting Florida, um, uh, you know, th th all of these are extremes that we hadn't before. And then when we look at the statistics for the hottest years, they're all in the last recent years. And the graph that you see um, when climate scientists speak is really frightening. And when the Secretary General of the United States says we're careering towards the abyss, 
we need to wake up and say, you know, this is really serious. And of course, the careering happens at different levels. Some, you know, this is a resilient part of the world. Um, it's, you know, the part of the world that Constance is from and um, Masimbi is from as a Kenyan um, national. Um, uh, you know, you, you see it much more in, the, in, in those places. And, and that's the injustice that it's hitting the poorest and the most vulnerable and the least resilient who have to try and become resilient and we're not doing enough to show solidarity. Yes. Um, but I hope that this conference here in California and the conference that the Secretary General is, um, is uh, planning for next year will help to increase the ambition, the, the awareness. We need a broad movement globally on this issue. Yes, and hopefully the summit will do that. Now, I know that we're going to wrap up the recorded part of our conversation, so I just want to say thanks again to Musimbi and Mary and to Constance as well. So we're going to stay up here, but um, thanks for the excellent discussion and the audience for your great questions. Um, well, <laughs> let's give a round of applause. <laughs>